Hello and welcome to the Edinburgh Science Festival. Software is running the world, but why is it still crashing? What is it about software systems that leads to these kind of failures? In this Sydney Michelson Memorial Lecture, author and software consultant Kevin Hanley explores failures in software, its application and how they affect us at different scales from user to society. This event is free for you to enjoy thanks to our festival sponsors and supporters. Edinburgh Science is an educational charity. Please consider making a donation through our website to support the work we do. Hello and welcome to the Edinburgh Science Festival. Uh, my name is Kevin Henney and today I want to look at basically what happens when computers go wrong. There's a lot of discussion in the media and we've been, um, it's become part of the public discussion and part of the public debate in recent years um, that perhaps technology companies are not being entirely straight with us and that there are cases where outcomes of everything from markets to elections have been distorted uh, in one way or another, intentionally or otherwise. But that is not really what I want to focus. I want to focus on actual errors, not uh, where humans are involved uh, intentionally trying to do something or where commercial interests are involved, but what happens in the case of actual errors. Um, mistakes, bugs, all of these things. Bug is such a friendly term. Um, and there are faults that we see and we get used to them. They are very public. Uh, for example, uh, this is a photograph that I took uh, a few years ago in uh, Madrid airport. This is a very public display. I'm sure it said something useful at the time, but at the moment it displays an error message. What we're seeing is a failure. What we're also seeing is the largest display of installation art on the planet is produced by people who develop software. They don't intentionally produce installation art, um, but there's a certain aesthetic. This is Copenhagen Airport, and there's a kind of a, a kind of delight to seeing this uh, sort of almost matrix-like uh, contrast in colour. Uh, when I went back through the airport, it was disappointingly replaced with a perfume advertisement. Now, I have taken enough of these photographs and shared enough of them that uh, it's become a bit of a thing. I get people uh, emailing me, um, messaging me, um, and tweeting at me uh, about uh, these errors. And it's got to the point um, that not, I don't just get airports, I get every kind of failure screen uh, you can imagine. Very much part of the public experience. Uh, it's even become a thing, uh, some enterprising soul went and put um, Kevlin Henney into the Urban Dictionary. So I am now actually a thing, a Kevlin Henney. I am associated with failure. Um, which is an interesting uh, uh, turn for, the, uh, uh, for my profession. Um, I'm actually in software development. I have a great deal of interest in uh, software quality, and that is the focus of my work. But it's also why I'm interested in some of these things. These represent the public side and sometimes the slightly more playful side. There's something else, though, that we get with this, and that the public gets exposed to something that we all have this experience. Um, when software fails, we get exposed to how it's built. We see, as it were, behind the curtain. Most of the time you have this beautiful illusion that what you have is um, something to do email. You have something that you can watch videos with, something you can play games on. And your device supports this illusion right up until the moment that it doesn't. And at that moment, when it falls apart, as if it cracks and falls onto the floor, quite literally crashes, you suddenly discover something about the technology behind it. In this particular case, uh, we discover that uh, most cash point machines are indeed running uh, Windows, Microsoft Windows, and normally a much older version. Um, we also discover that um, this one was sent to me uh, by someone in Canada. Uh, we discover that perhaps we know, you may know as a matter of course, that uh, uh, Canada, many of the provinces in Canada will uh, officially declare themselves bilingual and signs will be in both English and French. Apparently they are trilingual as well. Um, this one actually reveals a bit of code. Um, right there uh, we see the address structure uh, and that looks very unfamiliar if you're not familiar with code. Um, the programming language um, is a language called PHP and this is something a lot of websites uh, will be developed in. But here we see it uh, uh, right at the back end as it were a Kevlin Henney being printed out uh, into the real world. Uh, this is uh, also a rather interesting listing, uh, probably more interesting if you are a software developer. Um, this is a listing on a website. This is uh, what we call a stack trace. This is the uh, basically a shopping list of 
all the technologies and code uh, that have happened at the point of failure. Um, probably not what uh, Hilton wanted to reveal uh, to all of its users. And accidentally we can reveal some things that are, well, probably unintentional. Um, in October 2020, um, uh, Candelac Fairview, which is a real estate company in Canada that owns something like 12 malls across uh, Canada, um, had a little bit of a problem. Um, in uh, many shopping malls, you will find these information um, uh, screens, um, helpful kind of things, rolling adverts, things like that. And one of them was not working and it displayed a particular error screen. And this error screen shows you that they are using the Python programming language. This is a very popular language um, and everything from um, uh, teaching programming in schools all the way through to doing machine learning. It is uh, quite ubiquitous. Um, but what is also interesting is the wording here. We see in the midst of all of this wording, we see video analytics face encoder. Now, what, what, what could that possibly mean? It turns out that there is a camera on this device and they had taken around 5 million images of people's faces. Um, uh, not with the intent of holding on to them, but nonetheless, they were trying to profile the footfall. And uh, this was, uh, as it were, um, not the kind of surveillance people are expecting. So this caused a bit of a, a hoo-ha. So there's this accidental revelation at the moment of failure. Another thing that we find with these lovely information screens is other coding bugs, not just embarrassments, but um, occasional programming bugs. Um, we often associate computers, and classically people talk about number crunching. We associate them with computation. That's the clue, it's in the name. Glorified calculators at one level. But numbers, turns out that we've got a bit of a, bit of a weakness, a bit of a blind spot. Um, uh, we, people often forget, let's, let's check whether or not this goes negative. And as we can see that minus 1 a.m. or minus 1 p.m. are not really a time. Somebody forgot to check that this should probably mean it goes back a day. Now this is actually common enough, um, this kind of offset error, that I uh, encountered this one with Facebook uh, a few years ago. Uh, your feedback will be used to improve Facebook. I don't believe I noticed that happening. Um, thanks for taking the time to make a report. And I, if you look at the time, 31st of December, 1969. Now, some people think that face feels like Facebook has been around forever, but probably not that long. This is a very curious time, but it again tells us something about how our systems have been built. We have our own calendar systems. Uh, the, the calendar system we use these days is based on the Gregorian calendar. And it kind of has a sort of rough year zero and there's a lot of uh, adjustments that have been made to the calendar over the years. Um, if you want to go back to the beginning of the time, our best reckoning at the moment is 13.8 billion years ago. Uh, but that's not how it works with computers. Computers will normally have a fixed time from which they count and they will choose a beginning of time, an epoch. And one of the most common epochs is the 1st of January 1970. And many systems, um, this is known as Unix time, many systems will count or will calculate today's date based on the number of seconds since that point. So many computers will work to this. Now, what is interesting here is and that's, it's, that's, that's quite a nice way of working. Um, so every day is uh, 86,400 seconds, every standard day. So you, you can easily work out um, how many days have passed. But what, what happened here? Well. A couple of theories, a couple of theories, one of which is that this, um, uh, there was in the code, something was set to zero. Zero is a very common starting point for things before you actually um, set it to the value that you want. So something was set to zero. Um, but it wasn't set to the correct time. It wasn't set to some time in the 21st century. So it was left at zero. Um, and so one possibility is that it was time zone adjusted. So Facebook is based in the US. So uh, west of here would be going negative from the 1st of January 1970. If that's zero, then that's going to push you into um, uh, New Year's Eve. Uh, an alternative one is that sometimes um, in code, uh, developers will use a particular value to signal a failure or a lack of availability of something. And in this case, it is very likely that the time function that was being used 
uh, returned minus one to basically say, sorry, the time is not currently available. This service is not currently available. And that was interpreted as a time, except that minus one puts us back into 1969. So this kind of error, um, this kind of accidental zeroing or use of negatives is very common. But it also goes all the way to the other end of the uh, scale. And the other end of the scale is how big do numbers get on computers? Uh, there are lots of choices, um, but you know, this is uh, not like when a child asks, uh, you know, what is the biggest number? And many children will ask that question, and eventually, when they say, I think I've got the biggest number, they will give you a really big number. And as, as, as an adult, what you'll do is you'll just take that number and you'll add one. And this is how children learn about infinity or get tired of the whole idea. They go on forever, um, and we're used to that idea. Not so with computers. They are very finite. They're very bounded. And uh, we're familiar with this kind of limitation that we might have. And that limitation um, uh, is expressed very often in computers. We talk about bits. You may have heard uh, talk about 32-bit or 64-bit computing um, when comparing computers uh, or gaming consoles. That can go up to 128-bit. What does that actually mean? Well, if I just take a very simple example in terms of numeric limits, the way we normally count with our fingers is to count five and five. Um, that gives us 10. And there's a natural limit, we might think, um, in, in that sense. So I can't represent 11 very conveniently. Uh, so I literally run out of fingers here. Uh, with computers, they actually do something a little bit slyer than this. They, they take this and they work out, actually, with your fingers, you can count from zero to 1,023. Instead of using your digits in the classic way, we use them as binary digits, on and off one and zero. This is the one and zero association many people have um, uh, with computers. Um, and with my ten fingers, well, if I basically say that's one, that's two, then two of these, one plus two is three. If this is four, then this is five. And you're kind of limited by your dexterity, but this is 1,023 and that's zero. That's a ten-bit number, ten binary digits, which is pretty cool. I've just done over a thousand with these fingers. What you're looking at here is a um, is a licensing problem that I had a few years back um, where I was told that the license would expire in just over two billion days, which honestly, that's not really a concern in my lifetime or, or indeed the lifetime of uh, human civilization in all probability. Um, and the helpful message that your license has gone stale and must be updated, uh, either that or I'm a time traveler. What we're actually seeing here, that number, that two billion value is very significant um, in a 32-bit number, 32-bit whole number, that is the largest positive number I can express. And there's a negative counterpart. So there's about four billion values you can represent. So somehow Visual Studio's ended up rather, than, rather far from zero, uh, right at the other end of the scale. So we see these little errors popping out, sometimes on our desktop, sometimes on public displays, and uh, sometimes on our phones. Um, particularly common uh, is uh, uh, websites. Um, this is a, uh, we, you may occasionally come across things that tell you, there's this thing called NAN, which turns out to be popular. If you look out for it, if you haven't noticed it before, look out for it. It pops up on a few websites, very popular. NAN, what does NAN mean? It's just like, I'm not talking about your relatives here. NAN is short for not a number. It basically, the computer saying, I can't represent this as a number. You've asked me to do something and I can't do that as a number. You've tried to do something perhaps that is infinite. You have tried to take you know, one divide by zero. If you try and put one divide by zero on a calculator, it'll come back with an error. Um, if you do it on most phone calculators, it'll actually tell you you can't do this. Um, if you uh, do it in, um, in a web browser, uh, it'll tell you, I'm sorry, this is undefined. Uh, we know that um, four divided by two is two. We know that four divided by three is one and a third, or one remainder um, one. Um, but what does it mean to divide by zero? This is a very problematic question, doesn't have a proper answer. Um, and so it's very natural for the response to be, I'm sorry, this is not a number, I can't do this. Um, or alternatively, it could get worse. So uh, let, let's set, set sail. Um, let's set sail and go back in time to 1998. The USS Yorktown, which was um, a cruiser since uh, decommissioned in uh, the US Navy, uh, found itself upgraded or side-graded or downgraded to Windows. It also found itself stuck um, 
uh, as it were, uh, for a whole weekend, uh, unable to do anything because exactly this problem had occurred, um, divide by zero, um, and that disabled the whole cruiser. Um, just as a matter of interest, there is a there is a version of Windows that has been used for British submarines in the Royal Navy, and it was originally called Windows for Submarines. And I don't know how much irony there is in that name, uh, but it is always a source of humour. Uh, anyway, that this sank this well. This kept this uh, uh, ship dead in the water for a whole weekend. Now, sometimes these things go a little bit beyond inconvenience. Um, very costly inconvenience. I want to take you to 2012 now. In 2012, there was a company, the Knight Capital Group, that had something like, was responsible for something like one sixth of the trades on NASDAQ and the New York Stock Exchange. And it would be trading absolutely billions and billions of dollars per day. And um, that, that was then, um, back in 2012. Uh, they had, I think, actually in the bank, and there was actually their cash, um, probably just under $400 million. And on the 1st of August 2012, New York Stock Exchange um, uh, was going to implement an upgrade um, to allow better algorithmic trading. Now, you may be familiar with uh, scenes typically from movies of traders. Uh, that's human trading. Algorithmic trading is nowhere near as exciting. It doesn't involve an awful lot of shouting until things go wrong. Um, Algorithmic trading is where we cut out uh, the human being. Uh, we get our algorithms to decide what should be bought, what should be sold. And it turns out that they can do it a lot faster than human beings. Um, they c and uh, it also turns out they can do the wrong thing a lot faster. And this is unfortunately what happened to Knight Capital Group. So Knight Capital Group, on th they made their upgrades ready for the change that New York Stock Exchange had announced. Um, they upgraded their system. Um, on the 31st of July. And let's see, within 45 minutes of opening the market, they had basically lost $460 million, which is actually more than they're worth. Um, so this was really quite impressive. Uh, and actually more impressive is the fact that they, during the, that 45 minutes, they did actually lose billions, but this is what they managed to claw back. Um, transactions that are made in error uh, can effectively be reverted. This is what they were left with, a debt that was far larger than what they have. So Knight Capital Group, not really a, a thing anymore in the same way. Now, what happened there? This one was a perfect storm, a perfect storm of assumption and error. Uh, there were eight machines that needed to be upgraded. And this was done manually by hand, rather than the automatic upgrade that you might experience on your PC or your phone, where software is automatically upgraded. Somebody decided perhaps we should do this. Well, there's no need to worry about this. We're only going to do it once. Let's just do this manually. And they also decided not to um, have somebody check this. Uh, in other words, one person was responsible for doing this. Um, and we're normally used to the idea uh, of having somebody else check work, particularly when it's critical. That didn't happen in this case. There was the idea, oh, eight, it's so simple, we could only get it right. It was correctly installed on seven of the machines, but not on the eighth one. And what was the problem with that? Well, the problem was that the, um, uh, uh, the eighth one was running the old software, and it interpreted a particular piece of data, a particular field, in a way that mm, was not correct. And this was running code that hadn't actually been used for many years. So this got, suddenly got activated and it pumped the market full of millions of trades that were unwanted. Um, so this is the thing. Um, as uh, kind of safety critical systems and aviation expert Earl Wiener observed when talking about how we should be careful with automated systems, um, that for all their benefits and their precision, one of the things that they allow us to do is they uh, tune out small errors while creating opportunities for large ones. They amplify this, and they can also do it at a speed um, that will um, uh, leave humans standing. Now, there is this question of how much can you amplify errors? Well, I'll, I'll ask you a simple question here. Um, this is the book, The Making of a Fly. It was published in 1992. Apparently, if you are into genetics, and you are studying genetics, this is a landmark book. I'm afraid this is outside my domain of expertise. Um, but uh, apparently this is, this is an important book. 
as you can see from as you can see from the cover, this is a second-hand image. How much would you pay for a first-hand copy of this book? So this is the question we might might ask. Back in 2011, Michael Eisen had a look at the notice something on Amazon. What he noticed was that the price seemed a little bit odd, and there was one vendor who was offering it for $1.7 million. Well, that's quite a book. I mean, there are a few books of an antiquity that might be worth that, but you expect to see these kind of at Sotheby's. You don't expect to see that on Amazon. So one vendor was offering it at 1.7 million. Another was doing it at 2.2 million. But if you wanted it secondhand, it would just cost you $35. So what's going on here? How did this end up uh, happening? So he, uh, he did a little analysis put some numbers into a spreadsheet. Notice there were only two vendors. One was called Profnath, the other was called Board eBook. Uh, Amazon themselves did not have it, but um, you had these two vendors. And he tracked on successive days their respective prices. And he tracked the ratio between these. And it turns out that, um, that what you had was that Profnath would offer at 19, around 99.8% of the, uh, the price of board ebooks. Or let's put this in business terms. Profnath are undercutting board ebooks. They're undercutting the only other vendor in the market by a tiny fraction of a percentage, just a little bit, just enough to say we are the cheapest. Okay, that's all they're doing. So it's clear from this that Profnath actually have the book. They want to be the cheapest in the market, it means all they have to do is be cheaper than anybody else out there. Board eBooks, however, don't have the book. They have a different strategy. They're offering a markup of around 27%. Basically, their plot, their trick is they're going to say, give us the money, and then they go and buy it from the other vendor with a nice little 27% markup. These are the only two, only two players in the market. They are also running their own logic correctly. This is an interesting one. We often associate bugs with individual faults. An individual fault of a piece of software that could perhaps have been reviewed or tested individually. But here, what we see is that the algorithm for Profnath is working perfectly. And the algorithm for Bordy Book is working perfectly. There are no humans involved. But you put these two together and, and you let it run for a bit and it turns out that it topped out just around $23.5 million before somebody spotted that this was a problem. Now, Amazon now have checks in place to deal with such situations, but it shows what can happen when our assumptions are exposed. The assumption is that there is somebody, somebody out there who wants to buy this, that we are dealing with humans. And algorithmic trading um, is basically a large version of this, and while it's all working, it's great, but occasionally there are a few surprises. Um, so if we take, if we go back to 2016, um, it, the, uh, uh, the pound was uh, struggling a little bit after the Brexit referendum. Um, it destabilized uh, the economy and the strength of the pound quite significantly. And uh, the value, uh, uh, what's been happening there is that that has gradually and predictably eroded in one sense. But that was uh, all of the drops in the stock market or exchange rates were very clearly tied to specific events, announcements, uh, either by politicians or by companies, and so on. You could, and you could track these changes. But if we look at this graphic that the BBC reported uh, from early October 2016, there is a kind of sharp cliff edge that the pound falls over, crashing at a speed, it's just a matter of minutes. Now, humans are not able to be this stupid this fast. It takes a, it takes a machine to do this. Um, this is algorithmic trading um, in action. Um, and the consequence of the, uh, the Amazon example of the making of a fly, but played out in the markets. So we see that getting algorithms together, even when they are individually correct, where they will be correct with respect to assumptions, individually correct things put together can make a, a lot of surprises for us. But let's put humans back into the equation for a moment. A number of shoppers, a number of people, December 2018, experienced a little bit of a shock. For about a day, um, O2 lost coverage over most of the UK. People really uh, struggled um, a, a lot to get anything done. And given that we're going into the Christmas period there, uh, this was frustrating for people. Um, 
And the, this was nothing more elaborate. I mean, people were looking for a, a deep explanation. Maybe somebody had been hacked. Maybe there was, um, maybe there was some kind of crazy cybercrime going on. Maybe there was something uh, ransomware. That's become increasingly popular. And um, the NHS got attacked the year before, along with a number of other um, uh, public services around the world, by the WannaCry uh, ransomware. So perhaps it was that. It turns out it was a little bit simpler and a bit more embarrassing. Um, it turns out that it wasn't really O2, it was the Ericsson um, uh, hardware uh, or the software that Ericsson were running. They forgot to renew a license, not because it was going to expire in two billion days time, it was just an ordinary license had expired and that meant that um, uh, the software systems were no longer running and therefore the whole system was not running. Um, so we end up with these little surprises. But let's 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 go let's go somewhere else. That's that's, that's very that's very earthbound. Let's let's go to Mars. Mars is a planet that is notorious for eating probes. Um, and uh, this year, 2021, is actually has actually been a very successful year. Um, uh, three probes arrived um, successfully at Mars um, in February. Um, the United Arab Emirates, uh, China, and uh, the U.S. Uh, all sent probes. And the US successfully landed Perseverance and even flew a little helicopter, Ingenuity, on the surface. That was all successful, but Ingenuity flew about a week later than it was supposed to because of a software fault. Uh, they, they had to fix that one. But then there's the ones that, um, there's, there's a lot of other uh, examples here that kind of get interesting and probably the most notorious one is the metric mix-up, uh, the Mars Climate Observer in 1998. Um, NASA, um, had this uh, had this probe, uh, the Mars Climate Observer. It was it went all the way to Mars. It was supposed to insert into an orbit and monitor Mars's climate. Sadly, that did not happen. Um, the th uh, it's not we're not entirely sure whether it actually burnt up in the atmosphere or missed Mars completely, um, but it didn't quite get there. Uh, the fault was eventually traced to a bit of a mismatch between contractors. Um, NASA um, uses metric and specifies that, it's, um, uh, that all of its subcontractors use metric. <coughs> However, Lockheed Martin did not heed this and ended up using Imperial. And there was a slight mismatch in units. You had two pieces of software talking to each other um, and misinterpreting their values. So when it came to insert into orbit, uh, the one thing it didn't do was insert into orbit. Uh, so that's good old fashioned human error, um, but multiplied and amplified uh, through the power of software. Sometimes it can be even simpler and more embarrassing, not even a, a programming error, just a, a setup error, a configuration error. Um, and this, uh, this happened in November 2017. Um, uh, the, um, uh, the Russian um, uh, space agency, Roscosmos, was due to launch um, a weather uh, and climate monitoring satellite, uh, along with 18 other smaller satellites. Um, and it uh, launched them from uh, Vostochny. Uh, Vostochny is um, ooh, far, far, far in the east of Russia, uh, and it is um, it's one of uh, Russia's new uh, newer launch sites. Historically, um, rockets have gone up from one of two other sites, um, uh, Plesetsk or Baikonur, and uh, this was originally going to launch from Baikonur. Uh, it didn't reach orbit. The launch was successful. The first two stages were indeed successful, and then they lost contact. Um, a British Airways flight somewhere in, around Iceland saw the rocket re-entering the Earth's atmosphere. Turns out what had happened is that somebody had remembered to change the configuration for the first two stages, but not the final stage. The final stage still thought that it was being launched from somewhere a lot further west. So when it came its turn to, uh, uh, to fire up, orient itself with the heavens, it sort of suddenly realized, I'm, a, I'm in the wrong place. I need to get back to where I should be, which is a long way that way. Um, it, burnt, it burnt its fuel and re-entered the Earth's atmosphere to be seen by the British Airways flight. Uh, simple human error in that case. One of the oldest sayings in software development is Geigo, garbage in, garbage out. Uh, if you put the wrong thing in, you're not going to get the right thing out. And 
perhaps one of the most significant demonstrations of this that we all experience on a day-to-day -day basis is the spreadsheet. Many people working in business, business does not exist without spreadsheets. Um, it's part of the language and part of the assumption of the business world. And spreadsheets are incredibly powerful for as long as they've been around, very expressive, very simple way of entering data and organizing data, a simple grid layout. But it is, it is actually a programming system, a very modest programming system, but it's a programming system nonetheless. But unlike the programming system that software developers are used to, it is very easy to hide errors. It doesn't give you the same kind of feedback. Uh, and you know, this causes a few problems. Uh, Stephen Levy uh, observed in an article on spreadsheets that a Texas-based oil and gas company had fired several of its executives after they'd lost millions of dollars in an acquisition deal because of errors traced to a faulty financial analysis spreadsheet model. Now, what is more interesting about this is that this was 1984 when he wrote this and when um, this was observed. Even from the earliest days, um, the first spreadsheet uh, software was the late 70s, VisiCalc. Uh, these days, people tend to assume automatically Excel, um, but there have been many generations, VisiCalc, Lotus 123, Excel, and people, many people these days use Google Sheets. Um, and uh, this has been an idea that we have recognized or a problem that we have recognized. In one sense, it brings to, brings to mind that we often don't check these things. We assume that the spreadsheet is telling us the right answer um, because we think we put the right numbers in. Um, and we are often surprised when things don't work out. Now, in one sense, this is even less surprising. If we go back to the 19th century, some um, to uh, Charles Babbage, who is a, uh, kind of seen as the father of uh, modern computing, uh, and a uh, polymath and uh, extraordinary inventor uh, of the Victorian era. He created the difference engine and the analytical engine, uh, which were used, uh, or uh, uh, were supposed to be used for calculating navigational tables. Um, and he had a number of ideas of what computers might be capable of, and naturally he would uh, regale his colleagues um, uh, with their possibilities. But sometimes people get a little carried away. Um, as he observed, on two occasions, I asked, pray, Mr. Babbage, if you put into the machine wrong figures, will the right answers come out? I am not able rightly to apprehend the kind of confusion of ideas that could provoke such a question. And this is the challenge that we see multiplied by many spreadsheets um, based on our assumption. Our assumption is that whatever we do, the right thing will come out, that the answer is always meaningful, even if we can't see the assumptions or perhaps the faults uh, that exist in the spreadsheet. They are invisible to us. But sometimes we can see other problems, even if we are correct. Um, we have uh, other challenges. Sometimes spreadsheets can be a little bit too helpful. So uh, Excel is notorious for the fact that it will try to do a best effort conversion of anything that you put in to the spreadsheet. If you put in a number, then that's fine. If you put in something that looks like a date, then it will try and interpret it as a date, regardless of whether or not it is. If you put in something that's kind of like a number and has a particular notation, but isn't really supposed to be a number, it will also try and interpret that. Uh, it will try and correct it for you. If you have put a phone number in, it'll do things uh, with the phone number that really weren't intended uh, to uh, happen to it. And there was a study done a few years ago, uh, which we can see uh, this uh, spreadsheet um, uh, demonstrates um, that it looks like a bunch of dates, but actually these are gene names. Gene names typically have a few letters and often a number, a digit or two following them. And a study was done um, on uh, published papers in the space of genetics, and it was found that about one-fifth of them had errors that came about from these conversions, which is huge and actually led to a revision over the last year or so uh, of gene naming. Um, uh, it turns out that uh, spreadsheets have actually caused the genetics community to totally change how they name things, to avoid the possibility of these errors. Other errors pop up in other cases. So let's talk about, let's talk about our planet here. Um, this image is from a successful, successfully launched Russian uh, weather and climate satellite. Um, our atmosphere and our uh, hydrosphere uh, um, are experiencing unprecedented change, um, uh, anthropogenic uh, global warming. Uh, 
unfortunately is a side effect of the Industrial Revolution, of which, um, which gave us the, uh, uh, the, the drive for having things like the difference engine and uh, this need for mechanical computation. The side effect of that, unfortunately, is we've put rather a lot of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And uh, the science on this is incredibly clear. However, there have been some people who have tried to contradict this, um, uh, climate change deniers. And uh, there is a, a rather interesting example um, from a, uh, a publication, a book by uh, Ross McKittrick and Christopher Essex called Taken by Storm. It was published in 2002. And it tries to downplay or contradict the science on this. And they, one of the areas they try and talk about is, um, is to say, well, the, uh, the way that we measure things, the way that we calculate the average atmospheric temperature um, is a matter, more a matter of opinion than a matter of science. And, and this, is a, this is an interesting one. When we talk about the word average, uh, most people have a very sim uh, simple and stable and generally correct idea of what average means. If you want to find the average height of people in a room, you go around, you measure each person, you add up all of the heights, and you divide by the number of people. And for most people, that's enough. That's, that's the word average. That's our most common association. However, there are more than, there's more than one kind of average. That is known as the mean. We also have other kinds of average. Um, the median, which is the most popular, as it were, the most representative. So for example, um, to take an example from Hans Rosling, uh, a statistician, uh, he pointed out um, that, um, uh, as he was Swedish, he pointed out that um, you know, one might ask the simple question, uh, what is the average number of legs that people have in Sweden? Uh, it seems a rather interesting one, and it turns out the answer is not two. Um, the answer is just slightly under two. If we mean average by mean, um, people have no more than two legs, but um, uh, uh, either by birth or by amputation, some people have fewer limbs. So therefore, the number, the average number, will always be slightly under two. The mode, however, is two. That is the most common category. We have another one called the median. The median is kind of like the middle. This is the best one for dealing with salaries. What is the average salary? Um, it gets rid of certain extremes. What does the middle person, as it were, get? And then there's another thing called the root mean square. This one is less common, less well known. Um, it has a couple of uses, um, none of which are in the science of thermodynamics. Science of thermodynamics is based very much on the idea that temperature is based on mean. It is the average. Uh, however, um, uh, McKittrick and Essex decide to take some data and plot the trend of um, uh, over the years of uh, global temperature. And if they use the mean, they do acknowledge indeed that there is actually a rise in temperature. And so this is uh, before the much more recent uh, uh, sharpening of this curve. Uh, but nonetheless, they see that there is an approximate uh, warming of around 0.17 degrees per decade. Then they do this with the root mean square. Now, why they do this is best left to them, um, because that's not valid science. However, they do this, and they find that there is a negative trend. And by this, they hope to say, well, you see, you just change your choice of average, and it changes. Um, we can question the science on this, but there is another issue. And this was picked up by uh, Tim Lambert um, in 2004. He felt the numbers didn't look right. So he asked for the original data. And I, via him, I've asked for the original data as well. Um, and uh, one thing happens when you look at it. It's all in a spreadsheet. And when you look through the spreadsheet, you don't need to look at this in detail. If you look at this, you will notice there are gaps. There are blanks. That is where data for a particular location is missing. Now, this is an interesting one. What happens to those? Well, if you use a spreadsheet like Excel, if you ask for the average over a number of cells, it will correctly, because the average um, function is built into Excel, what it will do is correctly note the ones where there is a value, and it won't count the ones where there isn't. That's built in. However, root mean square is not built into um, Excel. Um, so um, uh, McKittrick uh, or Essex had to put this one together and forgot to account for the blank fields. And blank is interpreted in this context when you do any calculation on it 
as zero, which is far colder than everything around it. So naturally enough, it will make the temperatures feel cooler. When you supply the correct data, um, either by dividing by the right number uh, or by filling in from surrounding fields based on uh, an average, uh, then lo and behold, even RMS, the root mean square, shows all versions of the mean temperature show a rise. There are other cases where these little hiccups, failure to notice that something is missing, has some very significant consequences. Uh, in 2010, um, the economist uh, Carmen Reinhardt and Kenneth Rogoff, who had uh, previously worked for the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, uh, published a paper, um, uh, Growth in a Time of Debt. And this paper made a number of observations about um, uh, the relationship between economic growth and debt within a country. And based on this paper, uh, we saw the beginning of austerity economics. Um, austerity economics is basically justified by the conclusions of this paper, which is unfortunate. Um, and austerity economics was in full swing when in 2013, um, the original paper was reanalyzed and the original data, which was in a spreadsheet, uh, was analyzed. Um, with the, uh, the uh, suitable title, Does High Public Debt Consistently Stifle Economic Growth? Um, there, is, uh, there is the kind of observation, uh, sometimes known as Betteridge's Law of Headlines, um, that if you, a question is asked in a headline, then pretty much the answer is going to be no. Um, and in this case, it was no. They reanalyzed the data and they discovered that a number of rows were missing from the final calculation. The data was in the spreadsheet, but the rows were overlooked in the calculation. And when they recalculated it, uh, what they worked out is that instead of a particular um, uh, debt balance or debt ratio leading to a slight shrinkage of the economy, it led to growth. Not the kind of growth that you would, not, a, not large growth, but it was definitely not a shrinkage. Now, this is uh, this clearly has huge political ramifications. Uh, a small spreadsheet error, five rows missed on a spreadsheet. Um, justified austerity, austerity economics in a number of countries, which typically led to public services being cut. Um, and the, uh, as it were, the, uh, the uh, Greek economy was very, um, very heavily hit by this. Um, but in Britain, uh, there were a number of consequences uh, that were observed um, by the Institute for Public Policy Research. They published, uh, uh, published a um, a report in 2019 where they observed that had the, had the trends of the previous decades continued, um, that things would have been very different. As they observed, a decade of austerity has resulted in cuts to public health and prevention and mental health budgets in the NHS. They estimate that um, between 2012 and 2017, uh, there would have been 130,000 fewer deaths um, had austerity economics not been implemented in the UK as a result, ultimately, of a spreadsheet error. Uh, and in the current pandemic, um, fortunately, spreadsheets have also um, uh, hit the headlines. NHS England last year, somewhat notoriously uh, and unfortunately, underreported um, 16,000 uh, cases of COVID. There's a number of people were not notified, um, were not advised, and unfortunately, uh, uh, it spread and uh, helped to boost the second wave. Um, uh, consequence of, again, a spreadsheet uh, uh, problem. In this particular case, it was a limit um, on an old spreadsheet uh, format. Um, there are different formats, and there was a, a number of rows that were overlooked because the old format just didn't accommodate them. So this is fairly, this is fairly devastating, but uh, I end with a more local story. In Edinburgh, the uh, Children's Hospital, uh, which was opened in March um, 2021. It was supposed to open in July 2019, uh, and the, it suffered a number of problems, one of which was a rather fundamental one that ultimately um, uh, stemmed from a spreadsheet oversight. There was a, uh, a need in the critical care rooms to circulate the air completely. 10 times per hour. And that was a standard guideline that was in the original uh, um, uh, proposal. Unfortunately, uh, what had actually been implemented was four times an hour. And the, uh, the contractor probably copy and pasted this from an earlier version or from another equivalent um, uh, proposal. 
um, and uh, that turns out to be quite a, an expensive change to make. So there's a lot of impact to these seemingly um, humble errors of numbers and uh, oversights. Uh, what we see is that uh, away from the main public conversation about the role of technology, there's what happens when it actually goes wrong. Not when we get results that we don't like, not when somebody has an intention of doing something with software, uh, not when there is a company that wants to do something, or an individual that wants to do it, or a political movement that wants to do it. There is this simple question of what happens when either we as users do not understand that an error has occurred, uh, or software developers uh, introduce an issue um, that is a bug, uh, an error. Uh, in many cases, not even being able to see that that's the case, that a bug will arise when you bring two different systems together. But there are consequences that we find sometimes inconvenient. The inconvenient ones are we're um, rushing for a train and uh, an information board is not displaying what we want. Um, we can't find out where we need to be in an airport because uh, the information is wrong. That we're trying to do something on our phone, but the app has crashed. These are the everyday experiences, but some of these escalate to the point that they take out and have uh, huge consequences um, uh, for uh, companies and countries. Thank you very much. Thank you.